is business for teenagers? Jesse would definitely say yes. He's young, he's hungry, he's entrepreneurial, and he's resilient. Uh, and I really admire the grind that got him to living this kind of funny split life between one day being in a CEO's boardroom and then the next day being shouted at in calculus class because he missed class, all before he hit the, hit the age of 17. I also really admire his honesty, um, speaking about his experiences with mental health and his courage for getting on stage and speaking in front of thousands straight after a name like Gary Vaynerchuk, despite him having a fear of public speaking at the time. Jesse continues to excel, push himself forwards, and I think he's a really inspiring person to listen to. Picture this. It's 2018, and a 17-year-old Jesse K is standing on stage at the Sony Center in Toronto, in front of an audience of thousands, giving a talk right before Gary Vaynerchuk. And Jesse begins his speech by describing his lifelong struggle with severe anxiety and panic attacks. But despite that, Jesse went on to build a successful agency, working with some of the world's biggest athletes and business leaders. One lesson you should take away from this interview is that through sheer willpower, determination, and authenticity, Jesse has tackled his own challenges head on. He's got a great story and you'll enjoy listening to this. Well, we're here joined by, with Jesse K, uh, a 20-year-old entrepreneur and podcaster from New Jersey. Uh, Jesse, you're the CEO of Viber Media. Your clients have included Fanatics, Steiner Sports, uh, the pro skater Paul Rodriguez, and also you host the, the Trendsetters podcast, which is a podcast you started, started way before it was cool, um, with guests including Mark Cuban, Jack Dorsey, uh, to name a few. I think one of the most interesting parts about what you're doing as well is the fact that you're the co-founder of the Making Lemonade Fund, which is a Gen Z-led nonprofit raising over 100000 in relief for the CDC Foundation uh, and various other good causes. So, Jesse, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate you having me. And um, it's to, I know we've been trying to schedule this. Thank you guys for being <laughs> flexible with me. I'm pumped to be on. Hey, it's, we're pumped to have you. It's, it's awesome to have uh, another young person who's doing exceptional stuff on. Um, so maybe like starting at the beginning of your story, um, you know, that we're going to go through some of the transition moments in your life and talk through some of the things you've been working on. The first one that you've, you've noted down here is around, you know, the fact that you've, you've struggled to make changes through your life, moving particularly between schools. And I know that you're moving universities right now. So maybe let's talk a little bit about that first. Yeah, I'd be um, more than happy. And I guess I can give a quick overview of sort of those experiences, if that's helpful. Um, ever since I was nine, I've struggled with sort of panic attacks that stem from like, it started off as separation anxiety, and then it really just changed to like panic from change and getting out of places that I didn't feel super comfortable in. So like the transition to, I went to sleepaway camp when I was nine years old. I lasted six days there. I think I have the record for shortest time ever. They called my parents. They were like, <laughs> this kid says he's going to run away. Like you got to come get him. So uh, got picked up from there. And that was sort of the beginning of something I didn't know I had, which was sort of panic attacks and anxiety. And I didn't really know what it was at the time. Um, and that sort of followed me all through any major change. So like the start of the football season every year would throw me for a week or two until I got settled in to playing every year. Or like my first year of middle school is brutal. Like I'd be in the guidance counselor's office every day, just trying to get through the day and not freak out and go home. Same thing happened in high school, which I started to realize like, all right, this is an expectation. Uh, like it's a three to four week adjustment period for me to really get settled into anything. Um, and then in college, you know, my biggest fear as a kid was going to college because the fear always in my head was I don't want to go away from home. I'm terrified of going away from home, especially for an extended period amount of time for a night, let alone a month, two months, three months, four months at a time. So really all of my close business friends uh, didn't go to college and I knew I had to do it just more as a personal thing, more than anything else, less of right. the academic side. It was more like, I just need to do this to prove to myself that I could do it. So I went to a school called Stevens Institute of Technology, which is in Hoboken, New Jersey, 45 minutes from my house, 10 minutes from New York city, great business school, have nothing but great things to say about it and had a really tough transition. My uh, first year was brutal. I failed a class. I, um, struggled through school the transition lived in a dorm ended up like half commuting half living there the second semester of my college experience it was brutal 
Um, but eventually got through it. And I think that was kind of the beginning of my maturing, pretty much maturing, realizing that I can get through these transitions. And business was so helpful because I started traveling for work and conferences and speeches and all this stuff. And I realized I can do it. So luckily, like, got past that to a pretty good amount, lived with a bunch of me, lived alone last uh, spring, then lived with a bunch of roommates this fall, had an amazing time and uh, got a really cool opportunity to transfer to Cornell up in Ithaca, New York, uh, starting next semester, which I'm pumped about. But uh, like I was telling you guys before we started recording, it's like now we're inside the 30 day window of starting something and the same feelings sort of come up, but it's great because at this point I, I know it, I've lived it for 11 years. I can expect it. I sort of know how to deal with it and who to talk to. Um, but it's fun. I think this will be cool to listen back on for me in like a month or two months when I'm really in the thick of it. So kind of going back to those, uh, those first moments when you're going through some of those hard times, like what was it like to experience those, uh, those changes and kind of actually going through it in the moment? Brutal. Um, and it's gotten better as they've happened more often because I, you recognize patterns and I sort of know that, and my whole family knows my, I could not have done this without my parents and their help. It, they've been critical yeah. um, to being able to sort of work through this and get a great support team around me to do it. But it, I would not wish a panic attack on my worst enemy. Um, you feel like you're going to die. It's insane. And like, it's a never ending cycle for hours, days, weeks. It's horrible. Um, so when I didn't really recognize what it was and how to really cope with it, it was, I mean, it, it sort of alters your life and stops it. There's not really anything you can do to break the cycle. But I think the key thing I've learned just over the, from having to deal with this over the past decade is recognizing the feelings. Like I knew that within 30 days of this new transition, I'd feel it. Yeah. So making sure I started talking to the right people, writing stuff down, goal setting for it, having coping strategies. Like I'm just lucky now to have built enough understanding of what I've gone through over the last 10 years to really create a game plan for it. And do you think this is something that um, has shaped the way you approach life? Because I'd imagine since at being at a young age, having this separation anxiety, this panic attack stuff, this, you know, it makes you probably, I would imagine, feel different from other kids. But has that fueled you to maybe do different things or approach life in a way that other people don't? Yeah, I think um, in the moment it sucks, but I don't think I'd be the person I am today if I didn't go through those experiences. Um, I just think it gave me like a grit and a sense of appreciation when everything's good that like some of the small shit that we get upset about in real life really doesn't matter. Um, and we can get into more of those too, especially when we're talking about the nonprofit later on, like how yeah. some of the stuff that you think is a really terrible situation really isn't that bad after all. Um, but yeah, I think it... Um, uh, I've learned along the way sort of how to go about it and uh, recognize it for each situation that I sort of go through. Cause right. I think it's, I think it's like fascinating. Like you look at, uh, yeah. look at, if I were to Google Jesse K, I'd be like, Whoa, this guy seems like a complete badass. Probably like the most, like a confident, ambitious young guy that's accomplished so much that I probably wouldn't know the full story behind that. But I mean, yeah, like at the surface of, it, I feel like people that don't know you might not realize that this is a big part of shaped who you are. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, no, I think it, that's why uh, on my podcast and other shows I, try, I go and I, I really try to emphasize it, especially at the beginning, because uh, I think there's so many kids that are struggling with anxiety. And if I didn't figure it out, I would not be doing what I am today. Like it was critical to work through it. And business was the reason I was able to work through it. But without working through it, I'd be crippled in anxiety still over stupid shit. Like now, if you're putting out like five fires a day in business and work stuff, like one of those would have taken me down in the past. Um, yeah. So I really try and make it a key point of emphasis for people uh, because there's, I've just heard so many stories from people. They're coming up to me after I do some speech or hearing a podcast or some conference and they're like, my son or I or my brother struggles with this so much. And I think it'll be awesome for him to hear that it's possible to sort of deal with it and use it as an advantage moving forward. And I think that's so empowering, right? Building that resilience and knowing that you can do that and you can still achieve things like, you know, getting Gary Vaynerchuk on your podcast and doing these things at like before the age of even 20 as well. I mean, you know, it takes some people a whole, a whole lifetime to build up that confidence and to be able to do that through these struggles and hardships is just impressive. Thanks guys. I appreciate it. So I'd love to know, you know, that one of the first pursuits then um, that you, you went through was the podcast. Like, how does that come about? 
It's super funny. I was literally, I was 16 years old, still trying to like find myself. Like I was like that kind of fat kid interested in business, played sports, but like didn't really know what he was. Like I was like an offensive lineman in football. Like I wasn't in great shape, like good enough at sports, good enough at school. Didn't always knew that like business was my passion. And I was sitting in an entrepreneurship class that I actually tried to drop out of because I was like, you can't teach entrepreneurship. That's so stupid. <laughs> and I end up not dropping it. And because it's it too true, late. by the way, in my opinion. Oh, 100. Yeah, I thought so too. And it, it, I was sitting in the class and the year long project was you had to create a product or service and write a business plan about it. And I realized all these kids in my class had super creative ideas, but nobody really knew how to execute on their business plan. And I was like, there's got to be successful people who have done this, who can yeah. sort of share their messages with it. So that started the idea uh, to start the podcast, which was originally called 20 Under 20s, interviewing successful young entrepreneurs in their 20s or below for the next generation of uh, young entrepreneurs. And I love what, that. And when, when that happened, like, did, did you have a game plan? Did you have like a vision for the future? Was it like, let me just do this as like a project, see how it goes? Because it started when you off did as a this, project. Yeah, because like at the time, podcasts, was this 2017, right? Like, I'm sh like, Joe Rogan was already like pretty famous by then, but like at the time, yeah, period, this was 2016 like, actually. Okay. Which is crazy. And did you think about podcasts as like a business or is it like, did it seem obvious or no? No, not at all. It really just seemed like a good way to get a project done and also <laughs> a really good way to meet cool people who had like my thinking was if I emailed somebody on the Forbes 30 under 30 list or Mark Cuban and I was like, hey, will you talk to me for five minutes? Of course, they're going to say no. But if I said, hey, I have this podcast with this entire base, would you listen? They'd probably say yes. But the hard part was at first, I didn't have any listeners. I was going to so say, sending out, base <laughs> exactly. So I was literally sending out 350 cold emails a day, every day for Ooh. six months, just begging people to come on. Okay, sorry. Can, can I just like pause for a second? 350 <laughs> cold emails a day for six months. Uh, can you walk us through? Okay, like where did you find these emails? Was I was it, insane. Like, Okay, did, did, was it like <laughs> unique? Did you kind of copy paste and switch out a word? Pretty individual. I mean, I'd use the same like core body, like the three, four, but then I'd customize it. Like I'd add a sentence or two that was personalized, would yeah. search the internet using like Rocket Reach and MixMax and all these extensions to try and find emails. I'd guess emails, I'd track opens. I was insane. I'd literally like wake up in the morning, send 150, send 100 through school, and then send like another 100 at night. And like well, three Je people. Jesse, responding. you were putting us to shame right now. We've been doing about probably averaging about 30 to 40 a day. Yeah. We're like, okay, yeah, we got to up our game, clearly. It's so funny because before we got on this, uh, we were literally saying, you know, I don't think we could be doing any more in terms of code <laughs> outreach. No, you've literally just 10 x that. Yeah, I was insane. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> well, the thing is, this is what, like when we interviewed Connor, who's, who's your buddy, Connor Blakely, like this was a key part of like his strategy as well. I, I feel like, this idea of cold emailing, it sounds obvious, but I've only met certain people like you and Connor that have gone so far that you're sending hundreds a day. And to me, yeah. that seems like there's like a correlation of success Mazzara. there. Yeah, Mike Mazzara as well. Yeah. Yeah, it was insane, guys. It was wild. I would not recommend it. What was the success rate? Like, <laughs> was it not yeah. worth it? No, it was 100% worth it. Um, I was probably getting like three to five emails back a day. So like one to okay. 2%, but those three to five emails could change your life. So exactly. I was super satisfied with those three to five emails every day. Was, yeah, was there, a, was there like a moment, I don't know, like Mark Cuban or something that was the big, uh, the, the, the one that I don't know, it sticks out in your head as like that one cold email that you got to reply to. That was a big moment for you. Yeah, it's funny. The biggest one to me was probably like 30 days into starting it. I got an email back from Mark Cuban saying no. But my thinking was, if Mark Cuban's responding, clearly this is working. And I would have never imagined that three years later, he'd come on the show. But it, it was wild just getting a response from him and sort of gave me the motivation to email everybody from him to Warren Buffett to Jeff Bezos, getting nose on everybody, but getting responses, which led me to being like, wow, I should really pursue this. That's so impressive. And, and I bet you Mark Cuban was doing that just to give you the incentive to keep on moving. Yeah, like he was super nice are, in his first email. Respond. Yeah. Yeah. So, how did, so, that was wild. Yeah. So at what point then you, you started getting a few responses, um, you know, you just kept on chugging on and being resilient and keeping on moving forwards. Like what, what happened next? So I started the podcast. I sort of started building it out. It came out March of my end of March of my junior year of high school. And then uh, 
I got introduced to Brandon Steiner, who uh, at that point was the CEO and founder of Steiner Sports, which is a huge sports memorabilia company, and decided I want to intern for him and help him build out some of his social and digital channels. Uh, so once again, I was that weird kid who left high school every day at 11 a.m., senior year of high school, to go straight to his office and intern for him all day, which was an amazing experience. I learned so much, got to meet so many people, and then from there started my, uh, my business January of senior year of high school. And tell us more about business. Like, so what was it? Was it in the sports industry? What, what did you end up doing? Yeah, so it started off and it pretty much is similar today, just consulting with um, some larger brands and athletes and executives on all of their digital and social channels. So anything from like building out an Instagram page for X or working on brand deals and strategy for this team or this player or this brand or this executive, but with a pretty heavy emphasis on sort of sports and entertainment. That's super cool. And like, and how was it kind of just getting into that and then building that out? I mean, you must have been one of the first people who are starting to do this. It was tough at first, just being a 17 year old kid trying to like get people to respect and trust you. Um, but once we got some good results and like case studies and testimonials are the, it, it opens the door. Um, so I think it took a little bit to really build that credibility and trust. But once we did that, it was great. And like it, it, I, in my head, even today, it's less about the money I made back then or the credibility I got back then. It was just the experiences, like so many experiences that I'll have for the rest of my life that like I couldn't have imagined doing as a 17, 18, 19 year old. What, what are some of the most memorable ones from, from that time period? I mean, you can talk about that with such like passion and emotion. Cra just crazy. Like being a sports fan growing up, like I – like going to the ESPYs, walking the red carpet, going to the after parties, um, sitting in a, there's a video on, um, I think it, it's somewhere in my Instagram stories, but like flying on a helicopter with Joel Embiid to a Patriots game, like just crazy, <laughs> crazy stuff that was Love like that. once in a lifetime opportunities from different, or flying up with like Mariano Rivera to Syracuse for like a signing, like just so much stuff that I could have never imagined doing. And from the clients we got to work with and work we had just super, super lucky to do it. So you, you kind of had a bit of a taste of the sweet life by age 17. I mean, you know, how do you, how do you keep on moving forwards from there? At 17, I was fully convinced on telling my parents I wasn't going to college. Um, <laughs> And it's funny, my dad's also an entrepreneur and he was sort of the reason I wanted to get into business to begin with. And he sort of pushed me the whole way, like, yes, you can do all this stuff, but like, you're going to regret it if you don't at least try just for maturing and all the other stuff I dealt with. So ended up doing those applications, pushing ahead, trying to stay very like centered and focused on stuff outside of business too, just as much as inside. I wanted to make sure I like had a good social life and well-rounded because I know like I'll be working the rest of my life. I didn't want to rush it. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it, it was very tough when I'd have those like days where it's like, I'm supposed to be in class or studying, but I have this incredible opportunity and I'm a hundred percent going to take the opportunity and then sort of working through the ramifications of uh, the academic side or the uh, normal decision side. That, that seems like it requires like a pretty intense work ethic, right? So you got the podcast, you got the business, and you got school. Like what, what would you Throwing ADD look? too. Oh yeah. It's like, so shitty ADD. What, what, what's your <laughs> schedule? Do you sleep like two hours a day? Like did you, how did you even like, I, logistically I, in my head, I'm like, okay, how do you even like balance that? So back then uh, I was a horrible scheduler. Google Calendar became my best friend. Uh, I'd block out everything, but still like I'd forget stuff all the time. Like I was not organized enough. And I think prime example of this is freshman year of, uh, of college when I struggled. Like I made a jump. I thought I could do it all. I was traveling to conferences and I guess maybe pissing some teachers off for like, like the administration was giving me a go ahead to go speak at a conference, but the teachers weren't happy. And I think it was... Um, it was tough. I really like hit a low, I think freshman year when I was like, wow, I am not doing well in school. Like I, I, I was a person who'd always had very, like I had great grades all through high school and to like have a two point something GPA, like a sub three GPA during college, plus not really feeling like I fit in socially because I was traveling so much. I didn't really pay attention to meeting friends early on. I was like, this fucking sucks. So I applied to transfer other places, ended up getting in places, decided against going um really like went in on trying to build relationships at Stevens which I ended up did I love the school I've had some amazing relationships and then was just lucky that a really good opportunity presented itself that I couldn't turn down yeah 
because because I would imagine like especially the so like I mean I think back to my college experience it was probably the social stuff that mattered the most to me and I can imagine if you if you've just been at the ESPYs the frat basement doesn't seem as like appealing of a place to make friends you know relatively speaking yeah it's so weird like it's funny because all of that stuff is so fun but once again like the thing I struggled with that I finally recognized was like I want to be a 19 and 20 year old too I didn't yeah. just want to be the business guy who was traveling around and going to the stuff and didn't really have a social life. Like I can own one of uh, my mentors who now owns um, just from different advisors that I've spoken to, like uh, the, the biggest advice they gave me was like, you can never do your college years again. There's no being 45 and being like, you know what? I want to run that back. Like that can't happen. So I wanted to make sure I lived those years and continue to live those years properly. Um, and I can do all my other stuff with it, but I didn't want it to become, I didn't want that to prevent me from doing everything else. Yeah, I think that's really wise. I mean, I definitely met some of my best friends through college. Um, but I want to kind of go back to, to when you kicked off the business. Um, so you, you ran up the podcasting side of things. You were at university, you launched that. Um, and, you know, how, what does it take to start doing the business? Was it just that they were coming through ne the network that you had? You know, what was the very beginning of that? It was very referral-based and very random. Like just okay. random interactions with people would lead to an introduction that led to another introduction I didn't see coming, but there was no science to it. Like there was no like lead gen platform or like real business model. It was kind of just like, yeah, this person says they need help. Do you think you can help them out? Okay. And that, that was like pulling in your expertise as just being someone who's, you know, in Gen Z. Yeah, I think it was that plus the work I'd done with Steiner. We built out a pretty good show and platform for him and some other, uh, channels for his company that brought in a decent amount of revenue, which I think was a good experience. I'd built my podcast up to a decent base, Instagram up to a decent base. And then uh, really a couple of people just took a shot on me that I'll be forever grateful to. And we luckily did great with that. And I did great sort of building that out and keeping the relationship with them. Uh, and that sort of was my case study. I love that. And because I, I would presume that being, you know, 17, 18, and I'm, you're starting to get referrals, but you show up on, well, it wouldn't have been a Zoom call at that stage, but you show up at the meeting, you're like a, you know, squeaky clean 18 year old. You know, how do you, how do you get received at that stage by some of the top CEOs in the world? But I actually, it was funny. I got asked this exact question once in an interview. And I think the answer I gave then is the same answer I'd give today, which is strange. Like you need to know exactly why you're there and what your expertise is because the, yeah. like you walk into a boardroom with super successful Fortune 500 CEOs or executives or athletes, and you need to sort of stay in your lane and know what you're there for. Um, and then I really think it came down to like, if you can, if you know what you're talking about within a couple of minutes, you should be able to garner some respect and like credibility and you can show case studies, testimonials, obviously referrals are always the best because it's coming from somebody they trust. Um, but it, it was strange at first because this, keep in mind, this is coming from somebody who had terrible anxiety growing exactly. up and, was, and exactly. wasn't super secure in themselves to begin with. Yeah, um, I mean, suddenly in a room with people who have done 40 years of doing exactly that. A hundred percent. So I think that was a big jump. And then obviously that compounds and builds on each other. So like I was, I was terrified of public speaking, but my first public speech ever, I was 16 or 17 years old and it was in Toronto in front of 3,000 people right before Gary Vaynerchuk <laughs> and after that I could never be afraid of speaking again and, yeah. <laughs> right and and you know there, there's something crazy and I definitely want to go on to that that firstly that speech because I know Anthony really wants to talk about that <laughs> but there's, there, there's something really crazy about kind of the back and forth of okay you're you're going into these boardrooms with presumably like you know great heads old men and women and then you're coming out and you're back in the classroom you know, that's such a weird experience of this kind of changing. It was so weird. Mindset. Like leaving a meeting and getting paid for something to then go sit and get yelled at in like calculus class <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because exactly. I didn't understand the concept. There's a weird mind fuck for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, at some stage you're kind of, you must be starting to think about, okay, how do I make sense of all of this stuff that's going on in the world around me and where my place is in kind of, you know, which circles I belong in. Yeah, it, it was so weird because I'm just thinking back to like senior year or end of junior year of high school for me and senior year, like or early senior year, like I'm leaving school at 11 a.m. I played tennis for my high school the year before, but I couldn't senior year because I was leaving at 11 a.m. I was doing all this travel, but I also wanted to be friends with my high school friends, looking yeah. at colleges. I didn't know how to go about that whole process. It was strange. And it took me a while to really find 
myself and where I sort of fit in and what that mix and dynamic was. What, what were yeah. your like friends and fellow students like saying? Were they, did they think they you were kind of crazy? They thought I was crazy? fucking insane. <laughs> fucking insane. Well, of course they did. Cause they, I mean, they're probably like, you know, going home. Nobody knew what a podcast was. <laughs> but it probably also sounds really cool. They're like, yo, why is Jesse hanging out with like the NFL player right there? Why did I just see him on Instagram doing that? Oh, the best is when you have people that are like talking shit about you, like <laughs> all of your high school years and like, just talking shit and then they're like hey can i come with you to this event and it's like no <laughs> fuck off um, yeah. yeah exactly but no it was i was that crazy kid who like would walk around my sign i remember this vividly i'd walk around like my science lab class junior senior of high school taking people's phones to leave subscriptions and reviews on my podcast <laughs> that is an amazing tactic okay we're oh gonna write that Dude, down. i hit new i hit new and new noteworthy in three weeks i, I my school had 350 kids a grade and I went through every homeroom and I was like, can I say something real quick? And I'd go to all my friends and I'd say, please give me your phone. It will take 10 seconds. I promise. Take it that back if it doesn't. And I'd take their amazing. phone, subscribe, five stars, show is amazing, submit, three weeks, new and noteworthy. Jesse, I was on your podcast earlier and I was like, there's so many five stars here. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. They were all for me. Jesse's whole high school. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you to Northern Highlands Regional High School, class of 2018 for hooking that up. <laughs> Oh, that's just exceptional. So, yeah, back, back to that, that Gary Vaynerchuk moment, right, where you're on stage in front of 3,000 people. My dad fully – so keep in mind, my dad is my go-to for anxiety. Pat, like, he struggled with it when he was way younger. He, he built a super – it's funny. He actually went to Cornell, too, which was kind of the passion of me wanting to go there and built a okay. successful business right out of school. He's been running the same one since and grown it to an awesome company, and he's always – in my direct mentor and the person I went to for panic. He's my right hand guy with just working through that. I had an hour and a half long conversation with him today over lunch about my anxiety about school next month. All of that context what, 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 is. What, what, yeah. What an amazing, amazing relationship. To have. I would be nowhere near where I am without my parents hand, like most influential relationships. And I'm incredibly lucky to have that because I know so many people don't have such a supportive uh, set of household and parents and siblings who will support you no matter what and sort of always be there for you. And I was not an easy child. Um, but I think that's important to note because when I, I had a fly with my dad to Toronto, I was 16 or 17 and I ended up get, I'm actually not going to say that. I'll tell you guys offline what I was going to say, but, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 my legal sense came in. I'm not going to say the second part, but, um, to check into hotels, you have to be 18. So I ended up finding a workaround. That's what I was going to tell. found a workaround that made me 18 sometimes, um, in certain <laughs> States, but, um, to check into hotels. But at that point, my parents would have to go with me. So I keep in mind, I had horrible panic attacks, had never spoken in front of an audience. Like I practiced this speech. I had a uh, eight minute talk. I had practiced once and practiced in front of my mom, dad, younger brother, younger sister, four people got on a plane to Toronto, stepped onto <laughs> stage. Gary Vaynerchuk was after me right before the, right after the lunch break. And my dad was fully under the understanding that I was about to have a panic attack on stage in front of 3000 people. It was at the Sony Center in Toronto, which any of you guys can look up. I, like, you walk out and you see, like, an auditorium. You're like, all right, that's not that big. And then you look up, you're like, holy shit, there's a second floor. <laughs> so I, I was I, I was shocked that I got it together. And you can watch it on YouTube and you can see my voice, like, crack. If you look up, like, Jesse K. So, I don't know. It's something. It's from a – I think the video is from a company called Haste and Hustle. But um, it was terrifying. And after that, I've never been afraid of public speaking ever again. Okay, can, can we walk through, yeah, okay, wow. let's say the, the 10 seconds before you're getting on stage, what are you telling yourself? You know, like, are you, are you freaking out? Are you like, like trying to like take deep breaths? Are you saying, you know, I fucking got this. Like what, what was going through your, your head in the, like those 30 seconds it's, before the speech? It's so funny. Like, I'm just remembering this now. It feels like a lifetime ago. I haven't thought this <laughs> through in so long. I appreciate you guys bringing back the good yeah. memories. Um, about a minute and a half before my speech, some aide asked me what my walkout song was. And I was like, my what? And they're like, what do you want to walk out to on stage? I was like, I don't know, put Drake on. So Drake, <laughs> gonna say Drake. Like, was, for some reason, I was going to guess Drake. So Drake starts playing like 30 seconds before. So by that point, like 10 seconds before, I'm just in the zone, take a couple deep breaths, have no notes, have no, I had a slideshow actually. Yeah, they gave me a clicker. I had a slideshow. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to, I've always been good at like, being able to have talking points and hit them. Like I'm a very bad scripted guy. That's why my podcast like yours, I do very just casual and open. 
And I walked out there and it was a blur. And when I watched the video, I was shocked how decent I did. I didn't do well, but like for a first speech ever, I didn't shit the bed. And I was thrilled with that. Yeah, that's so great. And I mean, your dad must have been elated as well in the audience. My dad walks behind the stage after thinking I would be crying. And there were people like, I've never had this happen in my life. People were like asking to take pictures with me. And it was, I look at my dad, he looks at me and we're like, what the fuck changed today? Like me going from the kid who would cry and run to the guidance counselor's office about going to school, now giving a speech in front of 3,000 people and asking people to like take pictures. And one person asked me to sign something. I'm like, dude, I'll write my name. I don't have a signature. Like, what does that mean? So I'm not old enough for a signature yet. I'm like, I can write my name in cursive. Dude, the, 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 more, the more we hear about the story, I feel like I'm starting to like, it's starting to hit me how kind of absurd it is. It's like, it's like you starting off saying, yeah, I have a fear of drowning. I, am, I don't know how to swim. I don't do this. So then I became an Olympic swimmer. No, that's yeah. what it feels like. It's exactly like that. It was ins- like, I, I really haven't thought about that like day in depth in a really long time. And it, I, it really is. And I'm not saying this to like, hype myself up. I'm more saying this for your guys' audience, especially if anyone's out there struggling with something. Like if I, I, I started my speech off with this, I remember I said, I've had the worst panic and attacks and anxiety for my entire life. If I could be standing here on this stage at 16 years old, anyone can. And I truly believe that. Like if it, somebody like me could be doing that, anyone who struggles with anything has no excuse not to do. And I won't even say no excuse because back when I was struggling with stuff, you have every excuse, but no reason not to be able to work through it and have the confidence that you'll be able to do it one day well that's inspirational i'm I'm sure people were already doing a stand innovation in their head at that stage it was why and that really pushed me through like i think people picked up on my nerves and were super nice and clapped and did the whole thing that sort of got me through it but that eight minutes flew by you know what it's interesting because on one of another guest we had on um they spoke about how much power they had uh in the vulnerability it was a guy called chris you should definitely listen to it actually He's, he's awesome um, but it just seems like there's, if, if you really aren't afraid to show the fact that, or just put yourself on the table and say, you know, I've had panic attacks since I was what, nine years old and I'm here now today, you know, that takes a lot of courage in itself. And that's the only reason why I like talking about it. Like, I'm, I really don't want to say it to like, oh, look at me, I'm doing this. But like, to be able to say that I was a nine-year-old kid who had crippling anxiety, threatened to like... It's sunk in my head forever. I'd walk, I started having panic attacks at nine. I'd have to walk up and down the hill with my parents to go to middle school five minutes away to sit in the guidance counselor's office. And now next month, I'm going to Cornell four hours away to get a great education and run a business and an incredible nonprofit. Like it's possible. And the fact to think that like that horrible anxiety is only four or five years back is wild to think about and just shows the progress anyone can make. So I want to think about, you know, some of the, Kind of tactics that you've used to deal with something like that for other folks who are going through that it may not work for them obviously everyone's kind of case by case but what are some of the things that work for you jesse yeah i think before i even get to the tactical thing the the precursor to that which i think is more important is find what you're passionate about and use that to work out of your anxiety so yeah. for me I didn't know my passion was business until I realized my passion was business. So when I started my podcast, I did no matter what it was, I was going to do it to make it successful. So like the speaking thing would have panicked me, but I wanted to do it. And I realized when you flip the switch in your head from, oh my God, I have to do this to I need to do this and I want to do this, such a mindset shift and it worked me through my anxiety. So then more on a tactical level, um, I'll use an example. I was terrified of traveling alone. I mean, we're talking about a kid once again who like didn't go to middle school five minutes away because he'd freak out. And I had an opportunity to go do a speaking thing for the ESPYs. And then... um, go to the ESPYs and do the whole thing. And it was a eight day trip to LA alone. Didn't know anyone. And I, you get the anxious sort of vibes and the nerves and then you reposition it to nobody's. The reason I had my anxiety was because I felt trapped and I felt like I was forced to do something. Those were, I have to go to middle school. I have no ripcord. I can't get out of it. And instead of thinking about that with the trip to LA, it was, oh my God, I get to do this. Nobody gets to do this. I'm 17 years old getting, or 18 years old getting to walk down the red carpet at the ESPYs and sit and watch this whole thing, go to these parties. Like, how could I not be excited about that? And sort of, 
everyone has always told me it from therapists to my parents, like turn the anxiety into excitement. It's the same thing, just Mm -hmm. uh, understood different, but I really had to experience it multiple times to see that. So I still get anxious about stuff all the time, but in seconds I go from, Oh my God, I have to do this to like, wait, I chose to do this. I'm getting to do this. I'm incredibly excited to do this. Now let's go do it. That's super interesting. I mean, I've definitely heard um, like public speaking coaches have said about, talked about, you know, reframing that, that anxiety to excitement right in the minute before you start speaking. I know that it's something that um, quite a lot of uh, professional athletes speak about as well. It's, it's you know, turning it into a, a trigger that's, you know, for you know, just really pushing yourself forwards, and propelling yourself rather than holding you back. I think there's a lot of power in that reframing. I really like that. And also the opportunity when you think about it as like, I, you want to take challenges rather than stay in your comfort zone. That was a big thing I learned from Paul Rodriguez, who uh, was one of our clients and has been a friend since, who's one of the greatest skateboarders of all time. He's one of five people ever to have over 10 signature shoes with Nike, joined by LeBron, KD, Michael Jordan, and uh, Kobe, and it's him. So uh, elite at his sport an incredible athlete, incredible person. uh, Just some of the stuff I learned from him was like, complacency is not acceptable. Like satisfaction is, but if you want to be the best at what you do, like you can't be complacent and putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation that you know you can get through. A calculated uncomfortable situation should always be taken because you're never getting anywhere staying in your comfort zone. And once you break that, then that becomes your comfort zone and then you can progress to the next step. That is such powerful advice. I feel for like anyone listening to this and like what you just said, I feel like I need to rewatch that 10 times over again and play it in the morning when I, when I think about that. It's interesting to me that, you know, Paul Rodriguez and all these other people you've had a chance to get pretty close to or like some of those high achieving, high performing athletes, entertainers in the world. Um, apart from him, like, are, do, has that affected the way you think about the world? Because you, you know that, that saying, it's like the five people who you spend the most time with. If you're surrounding yourself with these high performing athletes, that must make you have like an athlete elite mindset, right? I think that the, like the whole concept of you become the average of the five people you surround yourself with is so true. When I transitioned from just hanging with like, and I love my friends from home and from high school and from college, they're amazing, but it's such a different vibe hanging with them. And with five of my closest friends in the world are business friends. I see them once a quarter, they live across the country, Oregon, Texas, Florida, Ohio, Minnesota, everywhere. But I get to talk to them every day. And just like the, when you're talking to people who struggle with similar issues and are going through the same challenges as you and are doing incredibly successful, by default, yeah. you start doing that and acting like that and facing the same struggles and attacking it the same way. I, I absolutely love that. And, and actually, you know, it's something that Anthony and I were talking about um, you know, we're obviously we're, we're building this podcast right now and we're, we're promoting it on across social media. One of the things that, um, I did yesterday was I, I pitched to, uh, someone via a video on Twitter and like sending that out for the first time, even though we're doing the podcasting was pretty uncomfortable. Cause I was like, wow, I'm just clicking send and they're going to see it. And that's that. And then it, there was another opportunity to do it literally, uh, later, uh, last, last night. And it was just a knee jerk reaction. I just did it because I'd already built becomes up easier, right? doing it right. So that the baseline of what's acceptable to you and what's normal starts to lift. And then you start to like kind of open your comfort zone much more and more. I totally agree. It's like a never ending mountain. You continue to climb. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, where, where does that end? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it, you, you want to make sure you stay happy. And I think yeah. the biggest thing is once again, you don't want to be complacent but you don't want to be miserable. Like satisfaction, I think is an important step in that process and counting your wins. I just don't like the feeling of permanent satisfaction, like complacency. So, so for you, like right now, I mean, what, what is one of these next like mountains, right? Like I'm, I'm assuming, you know, at this point, you've probably spoken in front of tens and thousands of people. Maybe that's not as difficult for you now. You're doing well in business. You've got um, your podcast. Like, is there something in your head now that like, that is your goal to break through the next layer of comfort zone? Yeah, I'd say there's two main points. Uh, Number one is to have a successful transition to Cornell this semester. It's going to be super unique and challenging, like in the middle of a pandemic, like going up there and trying to work through and meet all these new people and do that. And then the second one is raising um, half a million bucks 
for the Making Lemonade Fund, which is the nonprofit I started back in March. Our original goal was $100,000. And I said, it was me and one other friend who started it. And I said, I'd shave my head if we hit 100K, not (laughs) thinking that we'd grow from zero to 400 people and zero to $130,000 in 45 days. But uh, I'd say those are my main two uh, goals for 2021. That's amazing. So let's talk about that. Yeah. What, what, is, uh, what is the Making Lemonade Fund? How did it come about? Yeah, I appreciate why you guys. Did you pick up an- why did you pick up another pursuit, Jesse? I appreciate <laughs> you guys giving me the opportunity to talk about it. I think it's sort of the one I want to promote the most. Uh, really, it started off, I got sent home from college uh, early March. And I got home and I was just, my uncle and grandpa are both doctors and I'm in New Jersey. We were in like the hardest take COVID area and almost the world uh, for a good portion of time. And I just realized sort of the devastation it was causing. And I spoke to a friend, Alex Scheinman, uh, who's, I think he's 25 or 26, graduated from Penn State, known him through sports for a while. And uh, we were like, there's got to be a way our generation can do something. All these kids want to do something. They have no social scene now because they're locked in their houses. Like, what can we do? So we came to the conclusion we can start what literally started off as a GoFundMe uh, for a charity thing to raise money for the CDC Foundation, Feeding America and the Direct Relief Fund. And my sort of thesis on it was like, let's run this like a business, like, let's really scale the shit out of this. So started asking friends to join a Zoom meeting, and then they'd tell their friends. And I was just like, let's get everybody on. So every night for 72 straight nights, we had a meeting starting at 9 p.m., someone all the way till six in the morning, no lie. Every night, seven days a week for 72 days straight, I ran a meeting, like no questions asked. We had 50, 100, like 50 people, 100 people, all these people on our team ended up wrapping up at like 400 people from 100 different universities across the country. At some point we were raising like $7,500 a day, all benefiting these organizations. And now it's been a really cool shift. Like we sort of won't, went, uh, I can't even speak winded down, wound down. I don't know what the word is, but we slowed down the COVID relief part back in like June just to distribute that money. Uh, But now going into 2021, I didn't realize all the compliance issues on filing a real nonprofit, like just the time that takes. We've been working with lawyers on really getting that set up and we just got our trademark approved. I think We're, we're like on that pathway, which is great. And ideally for 2021, we want to be a platform where any Gen Z or or kid in college or athlete who wants to raise money and activate for a cause can do it through our network and uh, raise a whole bunch of money for some really cool causes. We've been able to like, obviously we did all the COVID relief stuff and then we've been able to do some grants to smaller stuff around pediatric cancer and a bunch of really, really cool uh, issues and causes. That is just fantastic. But you, you, that's a bit of a marathon in terms of like the amount of work that that's taken over those 72 days. That was when I didn't sleep because it was school <laughs> Plus my podcast, which took a little bit of a break, I'll say, during that time because I was just trying to prioritize stuff and that fell to the bottom. But school, business, that, and school. No, school, business, and the nonprofit, plus trying to like be able to talk with friends and sleep was – like I was sleeping like four or five hours a night. It wasn't good. (laughs) It was wild. (laughs) That is just insane. This is – Jesse, this is is an impressive amount of things you're doing. How do you feel about 2021? Are you – going to double down on more than the others? It seems like the, the charity is really close to your heart. Is that something you want to grow even more, maybe spend even more time on it this year? Yeah, it's funny. I never thought of myself as like a big nonprofit guy. I, I, I always liked making money and I was like, what's a nonprofit? Like, why would you do that? Why not just have a business that like gives money? But like just seeing the impact and I won't talk about specific um, stories on here. Uh, like I can tell you guys some cool stuff offline and maybe there's a way you guys can push it out to your audience. But like after doing the nonprofit, getting to see like local families and causes and stuff in need and getting, being able to be like, you know what? I've been there and done that. Like I can help has been so enjoyable to me. I never would have imagined it. And I love my business and I love my podcast and I love school, but just getting to do something where like you make no money from it. It takes up a bunch of time, but it's super enjoyable. Like I love doing it. It's really, really fun to get to use my network and some experiences to like help kids days or do help these families or help these causes in need. It's one of my favorite things. So I'd love to spend more time in the nonprofit in addition to building other stuff. Yeah, That's the cool part about being young. I, yeah, I can do a bunch of stuff once and see what works. It, it's completely true. I've always found when I've had kind of side projects, they actually help me have more classic thought in the main things that I'm doing as well. Agreed. That kind of I totally agree. And it's also been very like important to me on just really locking down 
scheduling and prioritizing and setting up systems for stuff like that was so important and setting up like barriers around because I'm the person that unfortunately is saying yes to everything. So that was a big thing I worked on in the second half of 2020 and working on hard in 2021. Like if I say yes to everything, I can't really do anything well. So I started setting boundaries, which was so important where I'm only working on a certain amount of projects and I know they'll get done right. In terms of those causes that you just outlined though, is there, is there one that's particularly close to your heart? Yeah, I'd say um, pediatric cancer is one that we never started off thinking about. Um, but just through a family I was ab able to meet, um, through my family actually, um, who is going through that right now and getting to just work with their family and see that it's brutal, especially during Corona, like just cancer alone sucks. Add in the fact of like pediatric cancer and it's fucking brutal. Um, so I think there's a lot of good that's being done in that space. I think there's a lot more that can be done in that space. So really want to continue to see how I can be helpful in that space. And then the main one is I think a lot of people our age and in Gen Z want to do charity stuff and volunteering, but they don't really know how I'd really love true. to be the platform yeah. where people can do it. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. And also, I mean, we discussed it with, with someone else as well, like, but finding, finding the thing that you want to be purposeful and, and, you know, put that energy into is, is really tough. Totally. And it was like, I, once again, I could have never imagined that like based off of a small thing that we were like, we're going to hopefully raise like $5,000 for the CDC foundation would turn into this entire like movement. And I've met some of my, the crazy part is like, I've met some of my best friends from making lemonade and we started in March and I've only been able to meet some of these people once or twice in person because of Corona, obviously. And like everyone's across the country. So like we have people from Pennsylvania, Michigan, California, Texas, Florida, Georgia, like all over the country and even in other countries. So it's been really, really cool to just see and build a cool network for our base. Yeah. And I, and I think there's, there's so much good, that obviously comes from, from nonprofits. Um, but I wish more folks would like kind of consider it as a, a potential thing that they could do on the side, because not only do you get kind of headspace away from your, your main project, um, but you also get to network like crazy and you get to meet amazing people and hear amazing stories. And I think all of that is just beneficial to you as a person. It also makes you realize how, once again, and I think this was something I said I wanted to mention later on, was it makes you realize how insignificant a lot of your problems are when okay. you're surrounded by so cool. much actual shit. Yeah. Like some of the stupid stuff that we spend time worrying about just doesn't matter in comparison to a lot of the stuff that you see when you're doing uh, nonprofit stuff. I feel like like COVID, at least for me personally, and I think a lot of people, uh, I personally felt like there's been a lot of life revelations from the reflection, the forced reflection of like the isolation. And I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about 2021. And I think everybody's probably going through some sort of version of that. And it sounds like one of your revelations was, like you're saying, maybe you didn't, never thought that something is like a nonprofit is something you're interested in. But I guess amidst all the craziness and changes happening in the world, you've actually found something super purposeful that kind of came out of nowhere, it seems like. A hundred percent. And I think it led me to just recognizing like still my priority long term is to be building a real company and sort of scale that up. But I think it made me realize how important it is to have a philanthropic angle to it and feel like yeah. I can do something cool, whether it's time or money or resources, whatever it is. I just think it's a, it's an important dynamic to add in there. I love that. What a civic leader. And so if people wanted to get in touch with you, um, for the Making Lemonade Fund? What, what do they do? How do they get in touch? And how yeah, can they I mean, I, yeah, so I think the biggest thing we're working on now is like we're building out our real team for rolling this out properly as a true nonprofit. Um, people could check us out on social at um, Making Lemonade Fund on Instagram. We just posted a cool video, I think, uh, or I posted on my feed at jesse.k11, and it was a cool highlight video um, of this year for Making Lemonade and sort of all of the stuff we've done, which is awesome. Would highly recommend people check that out. Uh, you could also email me, uh, jesse at vibermedia.com or jesse at makinglemonadefund.com, whichever you prefer, or you can text me at 201-298-9171. Well, that was very, very Gen Z of you putting that text on. <laughs> yeah, gotta be. <laughs> Growing so the community number in there is a key. So Jesse, 20 years from now, oh what boy. is Jesse K doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm eating for breakfast tomorrow, but uh, <laughs> 20 years from now, ideally building um, or scaling a uh, 
company that really has an impact on people in the world with a really cool philanthropic uh, angle that hopefully uh, sells for enough money that I can buy a sports team. <laughs> wait, wait, money you know, how, good mix. you know how Gary V talks about how he's going to buy the Jets? Is it the Jets, right? Yeah. Do you have one in mind? I think so. Yeah. Like, do you? Do you, or is this? I a, mean, I'm a huge. NHL team I'm or? a huge Knicks. I'm a huge Knicks Giants Yankees fan. That'd be cool. But like, the only reason I uh, I say that is because the odds of me owning one are statistically very insignificant. But in the <laughs> off chance that I do do it, it would be so cool to be like, hey, look at that podcast. I called it. I was going to say, yeah, the podcast on January 6, 2020, that was the moment yeah. you declared to the world your vision. I totally agree. So, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's why I throw that out there, but that, that would be ideal. Awesome. Uh, that's amazing, Jesse. Well, we, we were going to just randomly start chucking in this question, and so we're going to ask you, what's your favorite rom-com? Oh, wow. That's a that's – a th- that's a uh, – a curveball that I did not expect on this podcast. <laughs> Quite a curve. Uh, yeah, let me do some thinking. Uh, well, there's so many good ones that are like right. There are so the, many good ones. Like there's so many, and I don't even ones. really think of them as like rom com. I more just think of them as like comedies. But I guess a lot of them have like a rom com angle. Like there's so many good ones from Adam Sandler. Like I get you could call like click a rom com kind of kind of with Adam Sandler. I guess that's like my cop out answer. Um, I'm trying to think. There's so many, like any Will Ferrell movie or Adam Sandler movies, outstanding. Zookeeper is a good one. You know, it's my best. I don't really know if it counts, but like, am I getting spammed on text? I am. And it's like making noise every two seconds, which is annoying. I'll put myself on do not disturb as a, as a podcast host that pisses me off. <laughs> um, uh, happy Gilmore. I think that counts. And that's one of my favorite movies of all time. Boom. Happy that's Gilmore. my locked in answer. Happy Gilmore. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll record that. Final answer. I don't know. People might say that doesn't count as a rom-com, but I think there's enough in there to count. And Happy Gilmore is one of the best movies of all time. So I'm locking it in. Jesse, man, that's been awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Guys, really appreciate it. You're Thank doing really you, cool stuff on this. Uh, I think it'll be awesome and appreciate you having me.